Has anyone seen evolution around here? No, of course not. A lifetime would not be long enough to observe evolution, which is the process by which our genes change to give rise to new species. And it is incredibly slow. For example, in the two million years since we evolved from our ancestor, Homo erectus, our genome has changed by less than 1% in two million years. Now compare that to the pace of change occurring all around us in our everyday lives. The internet, artificial intelligence, our climate, social media, we've gone to the moon and back, and Mars is next. And so while change is happening all around us at warp speed, and evolution is moving at glacial speed, will we remain the same? Would that be a good thing? A bad thing? Here's an example. It's 2001, and we have just cloned and sequenced the human genome. It was miraculous. Some had said at the time it couldn't even be done. But the human genome was now sequenced, and it was actually published as an insert in Science Magazine. It was an amazing moment. I remember taking that insert home laying it out on the floor of the living room and calling my children over and saying, you have to look at this. This is amazing. Touch this. This is the sequence for the human genome. That effort took over a decade, cost $300 million, and today, for $1,000 in a few days, you can have your genome sequenced. This is a pace of change that has no meaning in evolutionary terms. But we have a second driver for change, our epigenome, which can actually respond rapidly to the environment around us. And it's changing us today in ways we are just beginning to understand for both good and bad. And soon, we will be able to control it. So why is evolution so slow? Changing genes is hard. And so, for example, the first step in changing a gene would be to acquire a mutation. And these mutations are generally random and rare, and they may only occur in one in a million people. And even then, only after it has escaped all of the mechanisms we have in place just to protect our DNA from the environment, and from these types of mutations. And of the 30 trillion cells in our body, only the germ cells, the ones who could pass that mutation on to the next generation, would count. So a mutation in a skin cell would do evolution no good. And if that mutation occurs in a sperm or an egg cell, and if it gets passed to the next generation, it has to be a beneficial mutation and has to provide a survival advantage so that then it can increase in the population and now give evolutionary drive. So is it any wonder that evolution is very much akin to the million monkeys on a million typewriters that could eventually write Shakespeare? But in contrast to this slow process for evolution of our genes, our epigenome is actually built to, dis to respond rapidly to changes in our environment. So the epigenome, it actually means on top of the genome. And the epigenome is a series of small chemical modifications that have been added either to the DNA or to the proteins that make up our chromosomes. And like the genes themselves, this epigenome is also inherited from one generation to the next. Now, a good analogy for understanding the relationship between our epigenome and our genome is a computer. So the genes that we get from mom and dad are very much like the hardware in your computer. When you've bought your PC, you have a PC, or you've bought a Mac, and now you have an Apple product. The epigenome is like the software on that computer. The epigenome is the software of the genome, and 
it tells the genome how to function. So while every cell in your body has the exact same DNA, the epigenetic software in cells are different. So for example, the epigenetic software in a liver cell will tell that cell to turn on liver genes and don't turn on muscle genes and turn on the enzymes you're going to need to make glucose. The epigenetic software in a skin cell will say, well, don't turn on those liver genes, but turn on those keratin genes so you can make that protective layer that we need for the skin. And so it is this epigenetic programming that makes the genome work. And just like your computer would be a very expensive paperweight without its software, so the genome cannot function without the epigenome. And another difference between the epigenome and the genome is that the epigenome is built to sense and respond to the environment. Here's an example. A fetus that is developing during a time of starvation will develop very differently than one that is developing during times when there are plenty of nutrients because the epigenetic programming is actually sensing the environment and reprogramming that individual in preparation for the tough times ahead. The epigenetic software of the liver will be different and cause the liver to make glucose differently. The muscle mass will be different. The pancreas will make insulin differently. All of this epigenetic reprogramming is in anticipation so that when that child is born, they will have a survival advantage in this starvation environment. And what we are learning is that this epigenetic reprogramming that can occur as an adaptation to our environment can actually then be inherited by subsequent generations. Now, this ability to adapt and help us survive, however, is a double-edged sword. Because not only can the epigenome sense and respond to our natural environment, but it can also sense and respond to chemicals in our environment. In fact, we are learning today that many of the chemicals that we are exposed to, particularly early in life, may be reprogramming our epigenome in ways that we then carry with us for the rest of our life and increase our susceptibility to disease. An example is obesity. And so we are learning now that there are many chemicals in our environment that if we are exposed to them early in life, in fact, these chemicals as a group are often called obesogens because of the way they change the epigenetic programming, change our metabolism, and then increase our susceptibility to obesity later in life. You may even know the names of some of these. Some of you may have heard of bisphenol A or BPA. And we're working very hard to remove this from plastics and consumer products. And you may have seen labels on your water bottles, BPA-free. BPA is an example of a chemical in our environment that we know can reprogram our epigenome in this way. In fact, you can look at infants who have been exposed to lead, and their neonatal blood spots have an epigenome that is different and can actually predict which of those infants are going to go on to become obese later in life. Another difference between mutations of genes and changes of our epigenome, which are themselves sometimes referred to as epimutations, is that we have tests that are often able to tell us which chemicals are dangerous and we want to keep them out of our environment. Decades ago, we realized there was a linkage between the ability of a chemical to cause a mutation in DNA and the ability of that chemical to cause cancer. And this linkage between the ability to mutate DNA and cause cancer is so strong that we have many tests today that we can use to screen chemicals before we allow them into our environment so that we can keep those chemicals out that can induce mutations that can potentially cause cancer. Unfortunately, we don't have a test like that for chemicals that can cause epimutations. And we know that these epimutations, like the mutations in genes themselves, can also be inherited from generation to generation. 
But what if we could harness the power of this epigenetic software and use it to drive change that could promote health? What if we could talk intentionally to our epigenome and influence its power over our genome? In fact, today we are poised to do just that. We have now discovered the enzymes in cells who are responsible for doing this epigenetic programming. We know who the readers, the writers, and the erasers of this epigenetic software are. And in fact, today we have unraveled the epigenetic software for over a hundred different cell types. And we have taken our first steps to using this knowledge. We are designing today epigenetic therapies for cancer. We know that when we put folate in our diet to help present spinal cord defects like spina bifida, that that folate is actually providing the raw materials that our epigenome needs to do its work. So, while our genes are remaining the same and change is accelerating at a pace we could only have imagined, our epigenome is able to respond to that change and we have the power to control it. Now is the time for us to harness the power of the epigenome and use it to our advantage. Now is the time for us to listen to what the environment is saying to our epigenome and maybe even change the conversation. Thank you.